Let's, this guy's ready. This guy's ready for the, the whole journey. All right, let's go to the moon and back again. All right. So. Very good. So my name is Zach Bush. I'm a medical doctor by training and uh, started that journey in the early 1990s when uh, I took a hard left turn out of engineering and went and took a year off uh, to go to the Philippines with an aunt of mine who had been living there for 13 years and uh, worked with a group of international midwives to birth babies for six months. And that was enough to radically change my young American kid mind uh, about how the world worked and uh, where we were going as a, a humanity perhaps was starting to be seated in there. Um, I grew up in low income housing in a pretty humble home in uh, what's kind of the government projects for low income peoples in the US and my parents were two hippies in that low income bracket uh, trying to figure out how to reject the common paradigm but still put food on the table in the late 60s, early 70s, and so came out of that environment, thought I you know, had kind of seen poverty, and then when I got to the Philippines, it was a whole radical you know, education in what's actually you know, the, the real truth about how economic systems have uh, functioned in, in relationship to humans, and it was my first look at uh, humans used as uh, capital, you know, human capital as a concept, and uh, kind of the extrapolation of modern day slavery in many ways and that uh, our apparel industries and our food industries are trickling back on these developing countries uh, and inflicting what's probably worse than slave conditions. I, I now live in Virginia. That was kind of the heart of the South in the United States under slave labor there. And uh, while slavery is a horrific manifestation in every form, there was a sense of you know, propriety for those that worked in that environment and that the landowners seemed to understand at least that the health of their slaves was the productivity of their land. And in our modern version of slavery, we are so divorced from the human capital that is burned at the bottom of our system that there is a complete lack of care uh, at any level in our textile industries or beyond. And it's unfortunately really subconscious. And so as an American consumer, I had absolutely no idea what that would look like until on the ground. And if you've been in Indonesia and all the rest, it's just horrific what we're capable of, of extracting from humans in the promise of letting them participate in an economic system. And that's a weird trade-off, you know. You can, you can work yourself to the bone in near-death experiences on a daily basis in horrific factories for the promise that you might make more money some other time in your life, you know? And it's a strange, strange promise that we've done. And I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, so you guys don't need orientation to this reality. But 30 years ago, that was the beginning of my slippery slope into where I am today. I took a huge detour uh, between that moment of maybe conscious seating and to where I am today. That took me hard into Western medicine. And I came back to I did, was not a good student, you know, historically leading up to my moment where I thought I would go into healthcare, and so I didn't think I could be a doctor. I went instead and was thinking nursing or something like that. Uh, but it became a slippery slope of curiosity and interest in the field, and eventually decided to go to medical school, and was really blown away by my first couple of days in medical school because we were given the opportunity to begin our journey in gross anatomy which is the opportunity to dissect a human body over about a four month period. You literally dissect every single little vessel and lymphatic drainage tube and everything else in that body over a four month period. And so when you are so steeped in the miracle of the human body for that long, uh, there's an opportunity there to kind of reconstruct again what you think it means to be alive. And that really started to happen in spades to me. And for the first time in my life, I became a really good student and kind of aced everything all the way through medical school because suddenly I had a three-dimensional model of, of the body to hang things on. And my worst courses in undergrad were organic chemistry and biology and you know, all the pre-med courses. But once I dissected that body, I suddenly felt like I had a, a matrix to, to go on. And I pursued that with gusto, uh, realizing that just like the cars that I used to work on and all that and the robotics that I thought I was going to go into, 
the body was a machine and I had looked at every muscle and every sinew and I felt like I know how that machine works. And so I went into uh, that journey very mechanically, I think, uh, mechanically minded that it makes sense that Western medicine would have solved this machine. And of course we would have fixed, you know, created surgeries and drugs that would fix every element of this machine because it's a big machine. And uh, you can deconstruct machines and you can put them back together. And so it made a lot of sense in the Newtonian world that I was living in at the time. But this, this little problem still existed in that I had seen babies born. And when you see a child born, it really forces a non-Newtonian experience into your life. Uh, there's no way that that robot self-assembled itself inside the womb of its mother by some means of linear thought or linear blueprint that, that told them each thing where to go. And so that nagged me a bit and then really blew apart when I started to do my clinical medicine and started spending time in ICUs and seeing people go in and out of near-death experiences, coming back with stories that simply didn't fit any sort of Newtonian version of life. And so that was kind of the journey in the long run to being forced out of a concrete model of what it means to be alive and to a bit more ethereal version that I think fits more into the quantum physics realm of reality rather than the biology realm. But both are true. Uh, we are biologic beings and we are quantum eternal beings that come in fully formed into a womb and then self-organize a body around that energy center. And then at the end of, of a human life, we let go of that biologic system to step back into the fully formed identity that we had before stepping into that body. And so when you bookend life like that, you realize that a system of slavery is set up uh, to every human being coming into our system, not just at the bottom of the economics. You and I are slaves to the belief that we are biologic beings metting out some sort of economic future for ourselves so that we can feed ourselves on a planet that's been feeding life for four billion years without a problem, without an economic system of money or monetary systems. And so you can see how quickly we're, we realize, wow, we, we have enslaved ourselves to a belief system and you guys are here to solve that. And that's literally what you all have been doing together this week in putting spores and logs and watching mushrooms do things and tracking trees and planting trees and everything you guys have been up to is really about decolonizing our mind and decolonizing the human heart and starting to move us back into right relationship with the being that stepped into your body at the beginning of all things. Each of you are so beautiful beyond your knowledge and beyond your experience. If you and I could really see each other, there would absolutely be no speaking. We would absolutely be overwhelmed in tears with the beauty that we could see before us. And looking out into an audience like this would be a completely overwhelming neurologic experience if I could really see you know, through a non-egoic lens uh, each of you. And if I could know your stories, I would weep and weep and weep uh, for the beauty that you guys are doing coming out of slavery. And I get to see people emerge from this enslaved mind and heart of humanity all the time in medicine. And it was always spectacular to witness. And most often that happens at the moment of our death, you know, days, hours, minutes, sometimes weeks before we let go of these bodies, we suddenly get the whole picture because uh, the veil gets really thin. And suddenly we look back at our lives and realize that all the failures that we had felt in our lives were actually uh, the belief systems of the colonialized heart and mind and not real and and we created a facade of failure and uh, really we were living our highest purpose and mission the whole time and the challenges that we brought into our own lives were so that we would grind down the belief systems that uh, humanity is stuck in and so our greatest crises are when we go nearly bankrupt or we go bankrupt when we are bankrupt in health and, and we suddenly can't get out of bed for weeks or months or years. These are our greatest moments. This is where you have set yourself a path to grind yourself down so you can no longer be programmed with the current paradigm. And we will do that stuff to ourselves voluntarily at the soul level. We will pick these paths to destroy the fabric of the imprisonment that we have set for ourselves. And we have been steadily working towards this over the, over the centuries. And I believe we're in a, a, a 
fantastic, lovely moment as humanity and that it's all coming to an end right now. Uh, the whole prison system of the human heart and mind is falling apart. That's why you guys are all here for one reason or another. You broke out of, out of the cell and you're starting to run around in fields together. I don't know how the week looked, but it, it was a lot of rain and cold, so maybe you didn't get as naked as we would hope. But uh, I hope that uh, at some point we're running around naked in fields again. And uh, I've had the blessing of driving by your stunning historic example of consciousness in stone with that Stonehenge the last couple of days here. And when you drive by that place, uh, that, that sits on the northern end of something called the Golden Meridian that runs down to just south of Durban, South Africa. And from that single longitudinal line, that's called Zeptepi in Egyptian ancient texts. And Zeptepi was the line of first time. If you think about a globe and spin that globe on its axis, you realize that the longitudinal lines are a measure of time because the sun sets and rises depending on the position of that planet as it spins. So the longitudinal lines are the measure of time. And so when the Egyptians called it Zeptepi, it was a literal understanding that this is where the earth stood. This was the first dawn when first life emerged. And now, of course, in our modern science and archaeology and anthropology, we find out that indeed all biodiversity on this planet leapt out of that one meridian, the beginning of time, the, the meridian of the beginning. And of course, the being that sits on, at Zeptepi energetically is that incredible lion-human god of the Egyptians, lion head on a human being, the oldest god in the Egyptian pantheon there. And so there was an, a consciousness that came through in some sort of emergence of the, the king of the jungle, as we have termed it in the Western world, but there's uh, a important reframing of that and that, that that was actually a female lion's head on that god and that the feminine was balanced with the masculine and there was an understanding of life passing upwards through its cascade of complexity that was met into its biodiversity and the biodiversity would allow for more adaptation and the adaptation would allow for more biodiversity and so from the beginning of time was set into play a pattern or a code within nature that in every iteration, and because biology is an iterative phenomenon, in every iteration of life on Earth, things would become more biodiverse. And in the biodiversity, we would find intelligence. And so this is my fascination now as a physician and historically as a scientist and all that is how is it that humans hold intelligence because protoplasmically at the genetic level we now know we are identical to pigs and we think of pigs as very smart creatures we treat them as if they are dirt uh, you know some sort of non-existent being because they are most horrifically treated animal in the entire food system but we are identical genetically to a pig down to the last nucleotide. We used to think we were 99.9 percent .9 identical to the pig that's what you'll still see in a lot of the literature but a really great team recently realized that if you maintain the, the perfect human genome and simply splice it into 178 puzzle pieces and rearrange that, pu the, that puzzle, it spells pig perfectly from start to finish. And so we are genetically identical to pigs and we are genetically sequenced right between a flea and a fruit fly. A flea has 13,000 genes, I'm sorry, a fruit fly has 13,000 genes and a flea has 30,000 genes, we have 20,000. So you're frankly a little closer to fruit fly than you are a flea, which makes sense because fleas can jump like 100 times greater than their height and you can't. And so you're not quite as good as a flea, but you're, you're damn much better than a fruit fly. So take heart <laughs> and drop your expectations on yourself. You sit somewhere between a fruit fly and a flea genetically. <laughs> and so when we sit here and make bumper stickers that say, save the planet, you know, we're going to save the planet. I think the planet laughs and be like, dude, you've you got 20,000 fucking genes. Like, <laughs> we would have equipped you better if you were here to save the planet. If we had worked through four billion years of life on waiting for you to come along to save us, 
we would have given you more genes and a bigger brain. You're, there's no way you were responsible for life on Earth. She would have equipped you differently. So what the hell are you? If you're just 20,000 genes, you're slightly better than a fruit fly and you're the same as a pig genetically, what the hell are we expressing? How is it that we can sit here and ponder the beginning of the universe? How is it that we have memory back to ancient Egypt and Zeptepi? How do we remember the pantheons of gods? How do we imagine quantum physics into its reality? How do we imagine the, the quantum chip that is now functioning at IBM? How are we playing with the very fabric of the universe with the CERN collider and finding the boson particles and the God particles? What the hell? People, like, this doesn't make sense genetically that you have any of this intelligence. It doesn't make sense that you're connected to all of this information. And so, in the end, we find out that gross anatomy is a very gross description of the magic that lies within you. There's a literal connection to magic, some sort of universal connection to information that cannot be held within your biology. We're the only species that has mastered fire. It's the original technology. It's the ability to control fire. One of the companies I know have had the blessing of bringing into fruition is an energy company that converts farm waste, plastics, tires into, into regenerative fuel. And, and we're able to make biofuel and jet fuel out of farm waste and allow farmers to start to participate in an economics that has been dominated by oil companies. And suddenly farmers, for the first time, could begin to exit the indentured servitude and slavery of the food system. Our food system has been relying on slave labor as far back as records have been kept. We have often fought wars so that we can enslave people to grow food for us. Which is kind of odd because you guys are volunteering to come out in the mud and the grime and the cornfields here and, and work on making food this week. So there's something that you guys are expressing this week about the spirit of wanting to create food has been lacking from the, much of the consciousness of humanity for tens of thousands of years as we've exploited our own peoples for the labor to produce food. And so by expanding farmers beyond the production of food and allowing them to participate in a multi-trillion dollar energy sector is a real fundamental change that has been waiting to happen for a very long time, I believe. And so I'm very excited to see many technologies starting to come into fruition here. Uh, one of these is uh, a company out of Australia that has a very old technology that it started to popularize called DuraPanel. And they take wheat straw and rice straw after the food is, is harvested and are able to turn that into really resilient systems of building material. And this young man comes up <laughs> to show us what the genetics of humanity is capable of. I'm Zach, what's your name? <laughs> Wanderer. 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 Not all those that wander are lost. Noah. Noah? Noah. Hi, Noah. How you Hi. doing? Hi. Do you want to sit on my lap? Do you want to sit up here? Alright, let's look at all these faces out here. Can you do me a favor and just tell me a little bit about what you see when you look out there? What do you see? From the mouth of babes. That wisdom. Do you see smiles? You create smiles. <laughs> you are a smile. It's nice to meet you, Noah. Thanks for coming to join me up here. Did you know that you're the center of this topic here today? That we're all here for you. Literally, we're here for you. And this is really a beautiful question of given the fact that we're so genetically simple, yes. what are we going to do for Noah? What are we going to do for Noah, named after another kid that built a boat, and saved a planet from an extinction? And so Noah comes along at a moment where his generation is the first that we will birth that is not expected to have a planet under its feet in its lifetime. And so we know that's probably not the destiny, else Noah wouldn't have picked this path. 
And so Noah's going to create a new world, and he's going to build some sort of ark into a future that we can, cannot glimpse yet, but we can feel it. We feel that Noah's going to be very successful in, in his future. And I'm watching so many children coming into this generation that I've had the blessing of working with in my clinic that are being diagnosed with something called autism. And these kids are such a, an incredible divine blessing on this planet right now because any kid on the spectrum cannot be programmed with the current paradigm. I literally do not have the neurology to receive it. And so we are birthing a generation of kids that cannot be programmed with a 40,000 year epoch of human beliefs, which is really a series of human trauma. They can feel the trauma and therefore they act as they do. An autistic child that hits their head against a wall six to eight hours a day to create enough pain so that they can focus and decrease the cacophony of sensory overload that happens in that autistic brain. They are, they are demonstrating the, the sensory processing of the pain of 40,000 years. But these kids are coming in on purpose. And this kid comes in with a lot of joy that's evident in his smile. And he's unfortunately super shy, so we're hoping that he can break out of his introverted path here. But, but Noah is showing us something really spectacular about being human is that he's so self-possessed that he has no problem staring out into all your faces here and knowing who he is. And I wouldn't be surprised, at, how old are you, Noah? You, you two and a half? You two? Yeah. yeah? Somewhere around two? All right, good enough. But somewhere around two, this, this guy is fully connected to Source still, and he hasn't lost his magic. Uh, one of my colleagues was running down his hallway uh, in his home, which is now his office. That's what happened during the pandemic, because everybody created it. So he has this, what was actually a utility closet in his house that became his home office. So he's running down his hall in the morning with his cup of coffee and uh, running late for his first Zoom meeting, no doubt, and then saw his five-year-old come tearing out of his room and run across the hall and go tearing into his three-year-old's room. And Noah would know that when a five-year-old comes tearing into your room, it's probably up to no good. And so Dad poked his head in, around the corner to see what was going on, make sure the three-year-old wasn't getting pounded on. And instead, the five-year-old had run into the room and had sat down at the feet of the three-year-old that was standing in the middle of his room with some linking logs in his hand. And the kid sat down in front of his little brother and said, Jimmy, can you tell me how it feels? Because I'm starting to forget. Dad burst out crying and listened to these two kids have a discussion about what it feels to be, to be connected to Source. Three-year-old and five-year-old can have that conversation. It's kind of mind-blowing. This kid's fully connected to Source right now, and so I think when he looks out at this field right here, he sees a lot of static that's been programmed into all of us as adults, and he is in a little bit of a state of wonderment as to why you all are, seem to be in control of the week, because he's probably got some better ideas on how this could be executed. <laughs> And so he's come up here to explain to you guys how this week could have been done better. <laughs> right? Am I right? You got some better ideas. Right? Yeah, of course. What do you think? It's right back in my court again. He keeps the <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I don't know if you could see what was happening there, but when he said, I wonder, he immediately looked up. And you'll see kids do this at this age. Um, but a little bit younger than, than Noah here, you'll see a kid wave goodbye to his mom or something like that. If you say bye-bye, they'll turn their hand around and wave at themselves. 
because they're watching other people wave at them like that. And they actually don't realize they're seeing something outside of themselves. They, they don't realize their hand is actually a representation out to the rest of the world. They see everything completely centric and they, they know they are the center of the universe. And then that switches around a little bit before age two, 18 months to two years, they'll, they'll flip their hand around and start waving bye to mom instead of themselves. And so they start to, at that moment, see themselves separate from you know, the world and not the center of the world. And so there's this fear that can slip into a two, three year old that wasn't there previously. We call it the terrible twos and the terrible threes or whatever it is. And we see a lot of temper tantrums and everything else. And I think it's because we start to lose the understanding that we are the center of the universe and the whole universe is sending us love. And we're this beam of, and that we are the, the receiver of all of the universe's love. And then we have to develop an egoic understanding of the world in the years to come to protect us in a world where we're not the center of source anymore. But kids at this age, whenever they wonder, they, they look straight up with a sense of intent. And as we age, we stop looking up when we wonder and we start looking down. And I find that interesting. We're sometime around junior high, high school, secondary school, you start to look downwards when, and you feel overwhelmed by the question or whatnot. And you start to be put under things. So when did we stop looking up and start looking down uh, in our choices and, and in our sense of self? And so Noah is showing us something in his countenance here of what it feels like to be the center of the universe. It seems pretty obvious that there was an open seat in the house when he came in. He's like, why are these people sitting on the floor? There's a good seat right there. And so he comes wandering up to take the last seat in the house. Totally unperturbed by your all's presence because he sees himself as the center of the universe. So this is the obvious place to sit when you're in the center of the universe. It's good stuff. So how are we going to act in these next years to come? How are we going to move ourselves into this future that we all know is possible? And you guys are certainly doing it. You're building community here. Uh, but when, we look at, when I look across this audience, I see a fair amount of consistency of age, background, genetics, and rest. And all of us are going to need to discover the capacity to hold Noah in verticalized, multi-generational, community again. Uh, and I just got to witness this in spades in Greystones, Ireland. Um, I hung out with a happy pair there, if you know those crazy twins. But they live in a community that they were born in, and they live within you know, a three minute walk of their parents, their, both of their younger siblings, and they work in, and live in a community that has known them since they were born. And so they've got 80, 85, 90 year olds walking around town that remember when they were born and remember when their parents were born. And so they live in a true verticalized community that has wisdom and memory in it that covers four generations or you know, 100, 120 years of history. And uh, one of their uh, kids who's uh, four years old, his best friend is a 67 year old woman. And he talks to her five to six times a day on the phone if he can't see her in town. And he goes over to her house and spends the night, one day a week, um, to bake cookies, work magic, do whatever they can think up together. And um, when, I, when he told me he had a best friend, I was like, had a certain sudden picture in my head of like, oh, cute little four-year-old girl, and he's telling me about this girl, and blah, blah, blah. And then, then his dad's like, no, no, she's actually a 67-year-old woman. It's like, <laughs> um, And so what is happening around the world is we are seeing the problem and we are starting to see the solutions. But we are, I think, lacking the connectivity vertically through our lives as to where do our genetics come from and where are our genetics yearning to. And uh, so I think we can just etherically call that in right now. So instead of all of us sitting in a room and you know, trying to dream up the future, let's close our eyes with Noah, if you want to close your eyes. If you don't trust me yet, keep them open. Close your eyes and let's bring ancestors into this room. Who is your favorite aunt who's gone? Who's your favorite grandmother who's gone? Which siblings have you lost? Which children have you lost? 
bring the ancestors in from above and below your point in the history. Bring those souls that died young. Bring in those souls that died old. And acknowledge that all of those souls were on perfect mission to bring us closer to this end of an epoch and the rebirth of a new human epoch. And while we've got all of these ancestors entering the room, I acknowledge my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. As we bring all of these in, I think there's an opportunity for us to understand that the healing of our society is going to be around healing the original wound, which seems to sit within the divine masculine that is in each of us. It is an injury that believes that we were rejected by nature. We've created long myths and stories about our rejection from the garden, rejection from nature. So we have an original wound that sits within the divine masculine. That is, we were rejected and we need to go fix the nature around us. And we are the provider for Noah. And we are the provider for our children. And so this is the fear that we have in our hearts and our minds as parents as grandparents, is that we're not doing enough to provide for these kids. For God's sakes, we're not even capable because we are not source. We are not the creator. But we put that amount of pressure on the men and on the masculine side of the women in our society. And for this, we act horribly towards each other. We kill each other for more resources than we need out of a fear that we will not provide enough because we've been told that we are the provider. And so we need to heal that divine masculine to find out that all that we were called to in the masculine state of our energetic being was to hold space for the feminine of nature to flow through to our offspring, to the nature within us and around us. And so we can begin this healing journey perhaps today. I've never done this with a group, and I'm kind of excited this is unfolding right now. I never know what's going to happen in one of these moments, but what it feels like we have the opportunity to do right now with generations in this room with us is to collectively decide that we are going to hold space for Noah. And we're not going to take responsibility for Noah's life or his future. Because if we try to fix his future, we will certainly destroy it. And we'll fall far short of the glory and the beauty there. And so ask all in this room to hold space. May the Divine Masculine step forward now, taking the place of the wounded masculine that thought had to fix everything. And we can hold space with the Divine Masculine within us, just as the very fabric of the universe holds space for the 0.0001% to become physically solid and express beauty. And so we can be the 99.99% right now to hold space for Noah to become the 0.001% among us to, to be the beauty. Let's take a collective super deep breath because to hold space takes a volumetric change. We can expand ourselves by taking that deep breath. Let's become bigger. Let's hold more space. <coughs> While you're taking that space, Noah has gotten off stage and is now curiously taking apart the stage <laughs> and the electronics underneath the stage out of curiosity. So as soon as we started to hold space, he got curious, and he's starting to innovate. Noah, thank you for being with me. It's good to meet you. We hold space for you. And through all of that space that we're capable of holding, the divine feminine within each of us can flow and connect to infinite resources. And the creativity of all of nature will pour through us. So it turns out that Noah is not intelligent because of his 20,000 human genes that he inherited from mom and dad. 
There's no gene in there that separates him from pig or fruit fly that suddenly gave him intelligence. So it's weird that our brains don't seem to be the source of intelligence until you figure out that structure of a computer. Uh, the CPU chip in the computer is what makes it fast and smart, right? Uh, the faster the, that Intel processor gets, the more things your smartphone can do. And your smartphone calculates more and more faster and faster, so you can download more and more apps quicker and quicker. And now you can live stream high definition television to distract yourself from the reality that we live in. So incredible technology, beautiful thing. But that Intel processor has never created a movie or a term paper or anything that it's processing through. It's just a central processing unit. It's not the source of information. And the thing that creates the term paper is the keyboard. The thing that creates the movie is the camera. Except no camera has ever created a movie. It's the human behind that camera that shot the movie from its imagination. It's the human that types on that keyboard that creates the innovative thought that becomes the term paper. And so it turns out though that that's just a human centric story version of where ideas come from. And when we start to look at gross anatomy and now we're getting the blessing of being able to look into microscopic neuroanatomy at the gut lining and beyond, we're realizing that the brain is just the CPU chip. It's big, so it can do lots and lots of calculations really, really quickly. And that separates us from a fruit fly that has a very, very, very tiny neurologic center that we would call a brain, and therefore does very few calculations in its life. But Noah, as he comes up here, it turns out has his central processing unit up here making sense of all the patterns. Glad to have you back. <laughs> And in his gut, he's got a near equal number of neurons that are not creating pattern recognition or doing pattern, you know, doing pattern information uh, transit. They're simply taking in information. And those neurons in his gut are so many in number that they equate to about the, the size of a dog's brain. So he's got human brain up here, dog's brain down here, but the entire dog brain is not meant to do all the different things that the central processing unit is supposed to do with the brain. Its only job is to listen. And what it's listening to is obviously the input that will become the fingers on the keyboard. So this is your central processing unit, the Intel processor, and it's gotten smarter and smarter with each iteration of life over the mammals and everything else. But it's listening, of course, to the keyboard. The keyboard is where the ideas will come from, and we now know that the, the fingers typing on that keyboard are not human. They are bacteria, and they are fungal, and they are protozoa, and they are parasites. And so what's happened in UCSF and UCSD, a couple of these universities recently, is they've started to be able to demonstrate what the keyboard looks like. And for the first time, we've realized that all these afferent nerves in the gut actually stick their little snouts, their little neural endings, out beyond the gut membrane into the mess of bacteria, fungi, and the rest to directly interact with the microbes. And we've been able to show that the stress of this brain can actually feed back down there and tell the microbiome that we're stressed as well. And the microbiome changes in a couple seconds. And so if you go through a sudden fight or flight response, your microbiome changes and vice versa. We can show that as the microbiome starts to become increasingly stressed, you can become stressed up here. And so if you give somebody an antibiotic, decimate about 80% of their microbiome diversity, their risk of major depression in the next six months goes up by somewhere around 24%. And if you give them two courses of antibiotics over a six or 12 month period, their risk of major depression goes up to 54% within the next six to 12 months. And we now know the mechanism of that because it actually takes a very specific set of bacteria to sit on top of the enteric endocrine cells, which account for like 10% of the 100 billion cells that are in your intestines. And so you've got billions of cells that are there to create the hormones that will drive your body, including the neurotransmitters that, like serotonin and dopamine. And we now know that 90% of the serotonin made in the human body is made in the gut lining by bacteria typing on the endocrine system of the human cells. 
And so both your neurotransmitters that will allow for your capacity to process information in the CPU and the information coming to that CPU is all coming from the bacteria and fungi. So what this starts to sound like is there's a great computer engineer in the sky that has been slowly perfecting the ability for a single organism to function as the perfect computer for nature to create her reality through. This is pretty trippy, weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say it differently this time though, just because if I said it the same way, it would get boring and you'd actually understand what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> So it's fascinating. So the CPU chip cannot come up with an idea. It's impossible for the brain to do that. It doesn't have a source of ideation in it. It has to have enormous amount of information to process in order to make patterns recognizable in it. And this is a little bit of the situation with an autistic brain is it's so overwired. It has so much information coming in that it can't sort to pattern because it's suddenly living in a 5D world with a 3D brain, okay? And so these children coming in, I think are wired in a way that it makes them impossible to see the world we saw it because they simply have more neural connections by the time they're two years old, three years old, five years old. And they're typically nonverbal when they're heavily affected. But when we started to work in the microbiome, we started to realize that the brain is not injured at all in an autistic child. In fact, many of you probably have seen this. They are hyper intelligent. They, are able to display a capacity of creativity and, and understanding of the universe they live in that just is beyond any other generation ever, ever born. So what the hell is happening seems to be a story of nature slowly progressing the capacity for biodiversity to dwell within a single organism so that there can be more perspectives of information or more data points shared to a single CPU chip. And in a very, bizarre turn of events we have discovered just in the last couple of years that the human colon is the most diverse ecosystem on the planet. More than a coral reef, more than your rainforest, the human body has been steadily progressing to its realization as the capacity to hold the highest number of micro microbial species in the smallest amount of space in history on planet Earth. Whew. So what is human intelligence? It is, the, it is the amalgamation of information streaming in from the diversity of the entire microbiome. The fungi have been creating you steadily, more and more intelligence through each iterative process so that nature can speak through a single species more effectively. You are the pinnacle technology of Earth. And it might go far beyond Earth. My favorite paper of the 20th century, well, we won't, let's start at the 21st century, it's a little more recent. My favorite paper of the 21st century, and I can already tell you that because it was published 10 years into the century and that nobody will write a cooler paper than this in the rest of the century, I don't think. But in 2010, it was published out of the School of Mines in Colorado by Nassim Haramein that many of you probably have heard of. And Nassim is an astrophysicist by training and has become obsessed around many phenomenon within the magical realms of the human consciousness and human creativity and all this. And he's currently working to uh, recreate the Ark of the Covenant. So there's a lot of people who feel like I have too many companies, I think, too broadly, and I'm just introduce them to Nassim Haramein and be like, he's trying to build the Ark of the Covenant, so back off. I'm still thinking very elementary over here. So he, he, he actually collapsed his, his first uh, uh, laboratory that was um, out in Hawaii. It lit, he created an implosion so powerful that it destroyed all of the equipment in the lab and tore the roof uh, into the building because uh, he got pretty close to creating the Ark. And um, so he's n now got better funding and is now down in, in Central America somewhere with his next lab in an undisclosed location, which if he succeeds, it will be a great advancement for Earth. If he fails, you want to know it because we'll disappear all at the same moment and <laughs> Earth will implode and be gone. 
Um, so there's, it's kind of a win-win scenario, right? Either we erase the, the history of human trauma or we become the next thing and stop the trauma loop. But Nassim wrote a paper that is mind-blowingly beautiful because of its simplicity. It's called the Universal Scaling Law. And what he showed us in that simple paper is that by taking a simple line graph uh, on the vertical, you plot the radius of everything in the universe from the biggest thing ever measured, which is the radius of the universe. Uh, and then on the bottom line, you plot every, the wavelength of vibration of everything in the universe. The universe itself has a very long wavelength of vibration that's, you know, that is universal. It, it emanates through the entire universe. It is the, the tone of the universe. And I love that. When Cinta does her singing, I think sometimes I get a, a glimpse of the harmonics of, of that vibration of the universe. And so I'm moved that the universe is singing a, a tone to us. On the other side of the scale is Planck's constant, which is the vibration of the electromagnetic field in a vacuum. And it's the tiniest thing that physics has ever measured. It is uh, known as Planck's constant. It's a, a numerical number, but that numerical number represents the, the wavelength of, of the electromagnetic field in a vacuum. So highest frequency of vibration, tiniest thing, way up in the corner. Biggest thing in the universe with the lowest vibration, way down in that corner. And then he started plotting everything in the universe and found that it makes a perfect line. With the exception of the current model that conventional science holds around the atom. It's logarithmically off the line. And so our current belief about atomic structure is frankly just wrong. And you remember that the current theory around atomic structure is there's no way you can get a, a proton and a neutron and a cloud of electrons to all hold together. And you certainly can't get lots of protons to cram right next to each other because they're all positively charged and there's no way that positive charge can dwell that close to each other unless there's Strong's force, dark matter, and all these fudge factors that we had to calculate in there. So with dark matter and with all, all this, you know, kind of fudge factor math, we've said here's the, the, the phenomenon of the atom, but it doesn't fit. So Nassim solved for that when he showed that the atom lines up perfectly on this universal scaling law linear trajectory if you start to take into consideration the mass of the vacuum space which is full, full of the electromagnetic field, which is Planck's constant. So he simply added up how many Planck's constants fit in a single cubic centimeter of vacuum space. The number he came out with is so astronomically massive that it made absolutely no sense from a logical standpoint. If you took the entire mass of all of the matter in the universe, every single star, every single quasar, every single planet, and crammed it into that same cubic centimeter, you're 13 zeros short. 10 to the 96 is the density of a vacuum space full of the electromagnetic field. All of the matter in the universe in the same is 10 to the 83rd or something. 13 zeros short of the mass of a single cubic centimeter of space is the entire universe and it's so this is trippy <laughs> but he was able to show that you no longer need the whole theory of dark matter you don't need the theory of strong's force you simply calculate the gravity within the vacuum space that holds the space for the atom to take on physical form and you find out that's plenty of gravity to hold protons right next to each other no problem it's plenty of force to hold the boson particles together within a single electron. And so we've created a bunch of fudge factors because we kept thinking that the universe was governed by the mass of the physical solid stuff. And he has shown us that the entire mass of the universe can't compete with a cubic centimeter of vacuum space. It's the emptiness that guides the physical structure of everything. Dead center of that line between Planck's constant and the universe on this universal scaling law line. Any guesses as to what comes up in the center? Noah. Noah comes up right there. 
Noah is dead center between Planck's constant and the universe. Human biology sits at the center point mathematically of everything that vibrates in the universe. It's too big of a story. It's too mysterious. And so what Nassim concluded in that paper is that humans and any other life form in the universe that takes on a similar size of biology and vibration that we do is what he calls the event horizon. The event horizon is that, that disk that comes spinning out of every black hole. So there's a black hole in the center of our universe. Maybe you heard that. It's okay. It's not dangerous to it. It created us. It's all good. Black hole in the center of our galaxy. So the universe is a black hole. Our galaxy has a black hole in it. And spitting out of the middle of our galaxy is that disk that we call the Milky Way. So you look up in the air and what you're looking at is basically a record, you know, like a disk spinning that's, that's on edge. And so it looks like a big stripe through the sky, just like if you looked at a, a record on edge. A CD, a CD, maybe you remember those. And, and so that disk of, of particle coming out of the center of a black hole is called the event horizon, which is just a spectacularly beautiful two words to put together. The event horizon. I love that it's singular. It's not the events horizon. It's not the horizon of all the events that occur, all the stars, all the things, all the lives. It is one event, it is the transmission of light from a waveform into light in a particle state. Let me repeat that because it's kind of important. You remember that guy Einstein coming along to tell us that light can be either a wave or a particle at exactly the same moment. The way in which a black hole works is to absorb all of the light that's coming towards it. And it has a huge gravitational force such that it can pull light to, to it in the waveform state, not, in the, not even in the particle state. So it's pulling light into it. And you remember that no light can emerge from the black hole. It's such a dense gravity. And the structure of that is a double torus. And it's a 64 double tetrahedron is, is the geometric shape that holds a black hole together. A, a double tetrahedron is the three-dimensional representation of the Star of David. Better said, the Star of David is the two-dimensional representation of a double tetrahedron. And it emanates through all sacred geometries of all peoples through all records of time. Within the double tetrahedron of the Star of David is 64 little tetrahedrons that fit in there. And in the very center is something called a cuboctahedron. But it's basically 64 tetrahedrons and a cuboctahedron in the center. And when you shine a light down through a 64 double tetrahedron model on the floor in two dimensions is, is the flower of life, which is engraved by some sort of laser technology in all of the largest stones in the pyramids and many of the other temples in Egypt some 10,000 years back, carved in those stones. Under the paws of the lions at the Palace of Knowledge in China, that also dates back, some seven to 10,000 years ago, is the flower of life wrapped around a ball under the paw of the lions of knowledge. And so what these ancient civilizations were telling us was the fabric of the universe, showing us the, the, the structure of black holes. Black holes take all of that light energy, don't let any of the light emerge in the form of, of waveform light that we would see with our eyes, and it turns it entirely into particle state and then shoots that out of its central location between the two gravitational fields that are made by those double tetrahedra when they're pushed together. A single tetrahedron holds a perfect sphere of gravitational force. And when you take two tetrahedrons and you push them together, you bend those two gravitational forces such that they look like donuts. And so you've got one donut sitting on top of the other donut. And the whole of the donut is where all of the light rushes into and then it is ejected in particle state out the center disk between those two donuts, and that's the event horizon. And so the galaxy is a particle expression of the light that was compressed within the black hole and then spit back in particle state, and you get a space dust that then self-organizes into four billion stars, 
that self-organized through their gravitational field more dust into planets at Fibonacci sequence distances from itself to create planets. And they then, through their gravitational force, collect other stardusts and over billions or trillions of years, they organize moons. And so in this beautiful way, light is expressed in particle state. But through Nassim's work and many other astrophysicists, we now know that the particle state is this tiny, tiny fraction of reality, 0.001% of our universe is solid. And the rest is so much more dense per cubic centimeter than the entire universe pushed into that same cubic centimeter. And so really what we live in is a matrix of the divine masculine that holds so much energy in it that can be converted by black holes into the visible beauty. And I think that is this transition, this dance between the masculine and the feminine of our universe. Let's hold space at such a gravitational density that it can organize the potential of light into particles and the particles can self-organize into beauty. And that's the dance we're in. Noah self-organized in the womb of his mother. I really kind of like not knowing whose mother it is because I can like look out there and just like think this is a collective result of this room, <laughs> this child. And so Noah self-organized in his mom's belly, which is, there's your belly, I'm talking about belly. Self-organized in her belly. Can you show everybody your hand? Show them your hand. Can you do that for me? Show them how many fingers you got. Yeah. How many fingers did you see there? Is that five fingers? Pretty sure. Both hands. Five fingers on both hands. Self-organized in his mother's womb. The very first thing that formed on Noah, actually he's pointing to it right now, well done, is his hard palate in his mouth. That was the very first structure that formed in the womb of his mother. That hard palate that he has his finger on right now, you can feel yours if you want, is the very first structure that forms in your body, which just seems really weird, priority. You know, <laughs> like, wasn't your heart, wasn't your damn brain, wasn't your gonads, it was your hard palate. And that hard palate becomes the foundation for life to organize, organize itself around. But interestingly, this is now happening in vacuum space. There's no cells that make his body yet. He's just a little globe of, of cells that are dividing and they're all identical. Uh, there's no cell differentiation at this stage of, of the embryonic development. And suddenly these cells start to differentiate at the midline of this ball and they start to move peripherally to become the hard palate. And the more information they have available, the more perfectly they line up by some invisible map to become the breadth and depth of his palate. If you're deficient in nutrients, they, the cells can't make it as far, and so they, they, they can't migrate to their correct position. And if they can't migrate to their correct position, he ends up with a keyhole palate, a very narrow palate. And if that palate is narrow, it changes his, the conformation of all of his cranial nerves. The 12 cranial nerves are your interface with the world and the way in which you sense it. And so there's a very mysterious dance in the womb of nutrients and the right position of our ability to sense the world. That's the very first thing that happens in embryology. And if that goes well, then the rest of the skeleton starts to form and the rest of the neural system right behind it. And so the, the, the spinal cord literally grows out of the hard palate into this tail that extends down into the future spinal column and the rest. And so in this magnificent dance, this bone forms to become the foundation of everything. And somehow those little bone cells, that will be future bone cells, know where to migrate to and then know how to birth teeth within them. And it happens to every one of us. 8 billion of us on the planet right now, and we've formed in exactly the same pattern of events in the womb, self-organizing around this invisible map. This seems absolutely impossible, that something as energetically demanding as a human cell can A, multiply at a rate that allows it to grow over just a couple of weeks' time to trillions of cells that will self-differentiate into dozens of organ systems that will all collaborate to make a human body in perfect form. 
until you find a couple more of the papers coming out of Nassim's group, and you find out that as they started to solve for the structure of the atom, he started to work on the shape and structure of the proton, find out that the current model of the proton didn't fit on his damn line either. In the end, he discovered that the proton that is in the center of every single atom of, of nature is a du double, 64, or double tetrahedron, 64 double tetrahedron, which is to say it's a black hole, which is taking light energy and turning it into particle state. And maybe you've heard that black holes are all connected through something called wormholes. And you know, famous astrophysicists, uh, Stephen Hawkins among them, discovered that there was information flowing between the black holes and flowing out of the black holes. And this information can be monitored by all kinds of sensory detection through radio antenna and the like. He held initially that it was all chaotic information just flowing out of black holes until they started finding great patterns of within this information flowing out of all the black holes of the universe and they're all connected. So it's starting to look like a hard drive of the information of the universe is held in all the black holes. And they all communicate into one knowledge field. And when you come to terms with the fact that every proton and every atom, and there's billions of atoms per every one of your 70 trillion human cells, are all black holes that have to be connected to all of the black holes in the universe, you suddenly realize that you are the manifestation of light into particle to manifest life within the womb of a mother into self-organizing universe that we would call a human body. You are the depiction of light in particle state. Each particle being meted out through the compression of light energy by the protons that started to take place within the atomic structure of your mother's womb. You are compressed light in the particle state. And the first law of thermodynamics and physics is that you can either create or destroy energy, which is to say you can either create nor destroy the electromagnetic field. It can only change form. And so we start to get a glimpse then of the difference of being a physical being and being a biologic being. Physics, I think, is what you really are. You are a physical being, not a biologic being. And what I mean by that is when you let go of the, the cell biology of your body, you become the energetic state of your original soul. You don't never lose the soul in the process of taking on the body, but you're only a finite expression of an infinite organization. And I find it fascinating that your soul can likely inhabit different spaces in the universe to then code its intelligence or its compression of energy into a different map as to what it will be. And the fact that all of my patients are able to leave the body, have these quantum bizarre travels in the universe, and then come snapping back into the body in their near death experiences, at no point losing track of their identity, trips me out immensely. Because when you let go of that physical body that's governed by a brain and everything else, you should not be able to have the same self-identity that you did as an eons old energy center that we would call a soul, if it was really a human journey. You are on a soul journey that knows itself at every single point of its expression. And if it chooses to inhabit the womb of a woman, it will self-organize light into particle to manifest a Noah. That's a beautiful story of creation that is happening as light becomes its full potential. But biology is super energy intensive. And so to keep Noah going, we have to create an enormous amount of energy at the cellular level. And unfortunately, the universe doesn't offer anything but physics for the delivery of energy. And it does that through suns, our stars. And so the stars are organized nuclear fission events where you have some elements on the periodic chart that are breaking apart to release an enormous amount of energy in the form of an electromagnetic field, which we would call light and heat and the rest. And so you got light emanating out of the sun. The sun must be pretty hot, right? Trippy heat right there at the surface of the sun. Except that you're, if you're just a few microns from the sun, it's actually absolute zero. 
it's freezing. The temperature on the surface of the sun, thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. The surface right off the surface of the sun, or the, the vacuum space right off the surface of the sun, is absolute zero because it has no particle. It's all in the wave state of the electromagnetic field. And it remains freezing cold until something is in the particle state. And then the particle state interacts with that electromagnetic field that's emanating out of, the, out of that field shooting out of the sun and suddenly warms up. The reason we can feel sunlight is because we are in the particle state. Our Earth is in particle state, and so it can generate heat from that distant sun. When you, as soon as you leave the Earth's atmosphere, it is at absolute zero. Trips me out. I can't figure it all out because it's just so ethereal, but I can feel the truth in all of it. My best friend from medical school, Chell Lindgren, just uh, was a, the captain of the International Space Station this past year. He was, it was his second trip up there. And when, you stand, when you're on that International Space Station outside of our Earth atmosphere and you look back down on the Earth, first of all, you get the best Instagram feed ever. Like, it's <laughs> so, I take all these pictures of like, from my lab, the microbiome, or look at me sitting next to this tree, and he sends in, here's the northern lights from space, you know, it's just like, Jesus Christ. Great Instagram feed, but you also get a, a new sunrise every 45 minutes, because the rate at which you travel around the circumference of the Earth. So he watched a new sunrise every 45 minutes for seven months. That's a lot of sunlight to witness. It's a lot of beauty to be seen. And the sun rises from space are as, just as insane as you can possibly imagine. Because the sun from space is just a tiny little star. And there's no heat warming your spacecraft. It's too small of a particle state to really absorb much heat. So you remain in, in right near absolute zero. And he was actually one of the, the few astronauts in the last decade to be out in space uh, in those little little suits that they put on that have little jet packs and everything else. And he was out there repairing the, the Hubble telescope with one of his missions in the International Space Station, another mission. And so he's out there alone, disconnected from his spaceship, looking back at the International Space Station in a little suit, hovering thousands of miles above Earth, looking down at us. And his experience was so simple is that he just couldn't wait to get back to his kids. And so that's just how simple being human is, is a, the marvel of the fact that we float in a vacuum space that's frozen at, at near absolute zero, but we are blessed with the, the remembrance of heat from the surface of a sun that emanates through space and time to hit our planet to warm up because we are a finite expression of infinite light because we're in the particle state. And so I'm very glad to tell you that you all have been here since the beginning of time as focused energy systems that can self-organize matter within different blueprints of what you want to create. And you all showed up right now to create a human body. And if we're to believe some of these things that have been told to through Pleiadian prophecies and other channels that have opened up uh, information streams from extraterrestrial sources and the rest. If we're to believe those, then it is saying that there are souls from all over the multiverse clamoring to try to get onto planet Earth right now. Fighting it out in the ethereal space to be able to inhabit a female womb, to give forth another being because a huge game is afoot. Because right now, the energetics of a universe rely on one small planet's vibration. Because at the center of all things between Planck's constant and the universe is human biology. And it burns extremely bright. The mitochondria that live inside of our cells cram full of the cell. This whole picture that you'll see in biology textbook of two mitochondria, it's a complete fallacy, and I don't even know who came up with the idea of doing that, but there's 200 mitochondria inside every single human cell, unless you're a neuron, in which case you have 2,000 mitochondria crammed full in that cytoplasm. The reason they don't draw it that way is probably because you couldn't see anything else other than a bunch of mitochondria. Mitochondria, contrary to that 
biology textbook, is not a human organelle. It's a bacteria that has its own genome and prol proliferates and, and lives within your cell environment. It's like kind of like a petri dish for a few species of mitochondria. It turns out there's many, many different variants of the genetics of mitochondria, and we're starting to realize they are probably the most plastic of species on the planet. And they've had to live within the confines of the human cell to have a protected enough space so that they, they don't have to deal with the vulnerabilities of changes in pH, temperature, everything else. It's always the same pH, always the same osmolality, super safe and protected environment, allows them to be very plastic in their expression of self. And so you're, even within a single mitochondria, you could have thousands of different genetic variants of the mitochondria in there over just a couple of years. And so there's this plastic, constantly reiterating re, uh, version of life that lives within your cells. And the biology textbook is correct in that these are the power plants of the human cell. What it doesn't tell you is it's taking chlorophyll products, which are called glucose and fatty acids, and breaking apart those double carbon bonds that the chlorophyll had put together. So chlorophyll and the green plants take CO2, single carbons, and build them into long strings of battery. And they're storing energy in the form of glucose or fatty acids. What are they storing? What is chlorophyll storing? Sunlight. Sunlight has to hit the, the chlorophyll. That sunlight, then as a vibration of the electromagnetic field, can be stored as a double carbon bond. And so CO2 coming in with carbon just attached to two oxygens can give up one of those oxygens, put one carbon bond over to another carbon, but the second carbon bond is full on electrical energy from the sun. It's an electron donated by sun. And so your double carbon bond is storage of solar energy. Your mitochondria that cram full of your cells are breaking those double carbon bonds apart and releasing sunlight. That's the energetics of life. And recent calculations, again, are blowing our minds that a single cubic centimeter of mitochondria produce about 10,000 times more light than the cubic centimeter of the surface of the sun. So what's the difference between being a physical being and being a biologic being? It's about 10,000 times more energy per cubic centimeter. 10,000 times more light per cubic centimeter. And so now imagine you, 70 trillion cells, all emanating light 10,000 times brighter than the sun in a different range of frequencies, so you can't see it at visible light, but you can sure feel it. Isn't it interesting when there are just some souls that are tuned such that when they walk into a busy room, everybody turns and looks at that person. They are connected to a, a source that vibrates at a, a unifying frequency that tunes the whole orchestra when it walks in. The whole, or, whole orchestra just, oh, okay, acknowledge that vibration, and then they go back to their conversation and everything else. I think we can all start to understand that we are light concentrated in the particle state, such that we would be a finite expression of beauty in an infinite being's journey. You will not lose your self-identity as you enter the body. Noah knows where he comes from, and he's fully connected to his eons old self. And so when he looks up and says, um, or I'm, I'm curious, and he looks up, he's looking at himself. I believe he's looking right up at his soul because it's a huge globe of energy that dominates our energy field above us. And some people think that's 15 or 20 feet above us. And then it emanates down through our pineal gland, projecting the original math such that the body can continue to recreate itself to the same map that was in your mother's womb when you were formed. There's this really ridiculous, annoying thing about quantum physics is that all of the solid stuff of the universe keeps disappearing and reappearing about a million times a second. <laughs> and so for all that 0.001%, you have to realize, well, it's only actually there sometimes. It's disappearing and reappearing. So the fact that you can keep self-organizing into the body you have is because your pineal gland is beaming constantly the template of life into you here. And we've seen some trippy, weird, bizarre examples of this that it actually is not actually temporally or physically connected in its nature of, of communication. 
such that if I were to draw your blood right now and take it back to London on the train with me this evening, and then have one of your colleagues give you an aspirin, all of the platelets in the tube of blood that I have in London will go into exactly the, the same state of aspirin effect that your cells in your body do. At the same instant. How? Why how? I love that question. That's a, that is the right question. Why, how, and maybe what the fuck? Your cells are hearing the person walking into the room that takes everybody's attention. That being that keeps walking into your room is you. It's an original life force that has coded itself into biology that is not temporarily, temporally or geographically limited in its expression. No matter where your cells are, when that bong hits, they all pay attention. They all know what organism they come from. This trips me out that we're doing living transplants. That's pretty weird. And the only organ we can do that with is really livers and kidneys. Kidneys because you have two and you can donate one and, and you can survive with one kidney if all goes well. But the, the liver is super fascinating. It's the only organ in the body that's constantly regenerative to the nth degree. You cannot destroy a liver. It's always rebirthing to its full potential. Of course, people die of cirrhosis, but that's because they've now interrupted their relationship to the original design of the liver with emotions. The only way you can carry human disease is to divorce yourself from the original blueprint by storing emotions in your biologic field. I, 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 those things sometimes pop through while I'm trying to tell you something else and it's so big then yeah, everybody, we all have to adjust to that information. <laughs> because I was simply just trying to tell you about a liver a second ago. <laughs> the liver, when it's uh, devised in the womb, has two lobes. And the right lobe of the liver is this tiny little tongue, tongue that hangs off the side of it. And that's what we take off to do a living donor liver transplant. So we remove this tiny little lobe that's about yay big, about the size of a, a a tangerine or something, and you put that into the other patient who's got a dead liver. Now you have somebody with two-thirds of a liver and somebody with one-third of a liver, basically. And then you do a CT scan three months later, and both of them have normal livers. Completely regenerate all the three-dimensional structures, the relationships, the bile ducts, everything else, and it's all there. It's the only organ that can do that level of generation in the body. It's kind of like the lizard's tail, totally regenerates itself, somehow remembers its perfect design. In our lab, though, we've gotten to see some really trippy stuff. It turns out that if you use the communication network of the microbiome that we extract from fossil soil, it's about 60 million years old. It's the richest topsoil that's ever been on the planet in our four billion history of life, and it's 14 billion year history as a planet happened about 55 million years ago. We had topsoil levels that were 20, 30 feet deep. They grew such no nutrient dense plants that the reptiles could be herbivores entirely eating spinach basically all day long and grow bodies four times bigger than an elephant. So the brontosaurus had a mouth the size of a horse, couldn't eat more than a horse can consume in a day. It's not a ruminant, so it's not like getting extra energy through its four stomachs, one stomach, just like the horse. And yet it was extracting so much nutrients from the small amount of vegetation it was, it had bodies as big as the Allosaurus or Brontosaurus. It's insane. We've never seen that level of nutrient density before. I told you a little bit about the incredible shit that happens when you get a colon that can hold more microbiome diversity than any other structure in the universe. You get intelligence. So the name of my com company is Intelligence of Nature because we've been studying the intelligence of those fossil soils and putting human cells in relationship to that fossil soil for the first time. Because we had the extinction event happen 55 million years ago, all that soil died, we've been struggling back towards that same intelligence, and humans come online 200,000 years ago. And so humans have literally never seen the full potential of the intelligence of the microbiome yet. So with quite a lot of interest, 12 years ago, we started introducing the little carbon molecules that are the intelligence of the microbiome to human biology for the first time. And some cool shit started happening right away. And that my first studies were in cancer. And cancer cells suddenly recognize what they are and they destroy themselves. 
through something called apoptosis, which was my area of expertise in chemotherapy. And so we were watching cancer cells go into apoptosis in a matter of minutes. My chemotherapy that I used to make out of vitamin A, which is, of course, a plant-based nutrient, would take 72 hours and about 6% of the cells would be dead. In contrast, these little cells from fossil soil were killing tumors in less than six hours at 100% you know, death rates. And so it was a really profound and beautiful journey into the possibility that Earth has not seen its full potential yet, and humans have never been close to the full potential of the intelligence of nature yet. When we put kidney cells, which are the least generative cells in the body, so I told you about the liver that can regenerate itself from the kidneys are the, the most vulnerable cells in the body, They're very poor regenerators, uh, very depleted in, in stem cells compared to other tissues. And so when you get a kidney injury, it's very unlikely you, re you get that kidney function back. And if it does, it takes you many years to get that kidney function to start to return. So we took kidney cells, the, the least generative cell in the body, and we took a, the least and most vulnerable cell within the kidney, which is the proximal renal tubule, and we put that into cell, cell petri dishes. And it's a very monotonous cell type. It looks like a little fibroblast, has no identity. It, it just sits there and it repeats itself. So it's basically like a cancer in a petri dish. It's just one cell replicating itself without any intelligence. And then we take that sterile petri dish full or of of kidney cells and we introduce for the first time the intelligence of nature from 60 million years ago. We came in the next morning to the lab and floating on top of the liquid was over 200 stem cells that had come out of nothing. Those 200 stem cells over the next 72 hours started making complex multicellular differentiated kidney tubules that were growing out of the petri dish. This has never been seen before. You get killed for this kind of shit. This is the weirdest thing, so much so that it's freaking John out so much. He's our chief scientist in, in our lab, trained in genetics in, at Johns Hopkins back 25 years ago. And he was actually the first guy to decode the genome of the fruit fly. So oh, it kind of comes back. And so um, John Gilday in our lab is watching this happen and destroys the petri dish out of just terror. He's like, this is science fiction shit that should not be happening. Been cell biologists for all these years watching this thing happen. So what the hell did that mean? What did it mean for humanity that when we touch ancient soil, we become generative instantly, even in petri dishes? In the same way that your platelets can respond instantly to an aspirin given miles away, that kidney started to build three-dimensional kidney because it remembered its original math because the bacteria and fungi explained it to it. I'm convinced that is how nature works now, is that we are remembered by all of nature because it's only in the complexity of all of nature that we get the complexity of design of human beings. Not only are those bacteria and fungi fueling our energetic life force in the form of mitochondria and the rest, they hold the original template by which you organized yourself in your mother's womb. Because that kidney started organizing itself in a petri dish outside of a mother's womb. And so it is starting to look like nature has coded for you in her biodiversity. She, in her biodiversity, did something called quorum sensing. We happen to see this in many different scientific models now that if you get enough biodiversity in a certain region, you start to get hyperintelligence that can't be explained by any of its constituents and their intelligence. And so this hyperintelligence happens through connectivity of vast biodiversity. It took nature, iterative processes of making more and more species of bacteria, fungi, and the rest before it could imagine us. You are the imagination of soil. And so it's taken us this long in this day in the talking circles around you to explain to you that you have had your hands and feet in the soils that have brought you forth. And it did that so that it can show God, the template of the universe, how beautiful it is. 
because you are the first species that was given five senses that were designed to believe you were separate. That's what The Course in Miracles says. You have five senses that were designed to give you the belief that you're separate. Your eyes deceive you. Your ears deceive you. Noah knows that he is at one with all of us, but his five senses are slowly deprogramming him to believe that he is separate from all other people around him and he's separate from the nature that he's from. And so our five senses were designed, perhaps by self, perhaps by your highest self, to give you a journey into separateness. In the low vibration state of separateness, you have to protect yourself with an ego. The ego is a genius creation of the human mind and consciousness to protect us in an environment where we are fighting for limited resources because we are in a universe that must be scarce because we're separate from anything, everything and we were rejected by nature and we have to go fight it out. And so we sit in our state of being fighting for limited resources and this egoic mind. So what's the solution? At the end of this 50,000 year epoch that now comes to an end, where we have played out the whole game, we've played out the egoic game to all of its colonial masturbations and destructions and all the rest, what is next for a species that believes itself separate? Geophagy. Geophagy. Will the earth swallow us back in? or we swallow the earth. We're gonna lose that fight, I'm pretty sure. But I think there's a next vibration of realization that the five senses in giving us the understanding of separation were designed not for us to have to protect ourselves from nature, but were designed for us to be able to see nature. It's a lot like that. Was it Archimedes that said, give me a platform and I'll move the earth? That concept of if I just had a, yeah, if I had a platform to stand on and I could fulcrum the whole earth with a long enough lever. Which one is it? Da Vinci. da Vinci said this. So it's Leonardo da Vinci. Give me a platform and I will move the earth. Give me a platform that's far enough from nature that I can see it and I will tell you how beautiful she is. I don't think the fish can see how beautiful the ocean is. Victor Schauberger, greatest mind of the 20th century arguably, was a fifth generation forester in the hills of the Austrian Alps. Fifth generation forester, meaning four generations of men before him walked those same slopes and watched nature. He was one of the most intelligent brains of the 20th century for the collective experience of witnessing nature. But I think the breakthrough happened in his generation because he was willing to be witnessed by nature. So you running around, me running around, and we saying we're activists and we're going to save the planet and we can see the earth. Why are we falling so short of our mission? Why are we so divisive? Why are we so angry at ourselves? Why are we so hurt? Why are we so polarizing when we walk into a room? Why are we so full of judgment? It's because we keep thinking that our purpose is to see nature when in fact maybe our transformation will happen when we are willing to be seen by nature. When we simply take a sterile petri dish of kidney cells and let nature see that for a second, the kidney rebuilds itself. Let me repeat that, okay? When you will be seen by nature, if you will let down your egoic shield and be seen by her, you will self-organize into a new being. And I believe Victor Schauberger kind of embodied that moment. And what he witnessed was so profound. He showed us that for all the times that he watched an eagle fly over these high mountain lakes in Austria, and they would circle the the lake until a trout would pick up the shadow of that eagle and would follow it in tighter and tighter circles and the eagles flying into that vortex 
And right at the last second, it grabs that fish out of the water. And he watched this, wrote papers on it, all of this, of the fishing techniques of the Austrian eagle, blah, blah, blah. One day, though, he was out there and he witnessed from an a advantageous angle a trout swimming around the perimeter of a mountain lake. And he knew exactly what that meant. He looked up in the air, he's looking for the eagle. And he sat there for, I can't remember, 30, 60 minutes, no eagle. And this fish is just so patiently circling this lake. Pretty soon, eagle flies over, spots the, the damn fish, and like, oh, starts following the fish. And the fish starts swimming in a tighter and tighter circle. And in the last split second, as he's bringing the eagle closer and closer down to the water, Victor realizes he had completely missed seeing the entire story. And then he realized he had never seen the eagle's talons break the water. The fish always jumped out of the water into the talons of the eagle. And he realized that the fish is fishing for an eagle when it begins the vortex. And it's calling in the eagle. And it's bringing it down to the water's surface so that it's easy to jump into its talons and become something greater than fish so that it can see the beauty of the lake that it has spent its whole life in, that it can't see from the vantage point of being fish. We are getting so damn close, people, to the purpose of nature. The pinnacle purpose of nature is to see the beauty of itself. And it invented us. I think we're right on it. And so as this epoch comes to an end, and we ask each other what we will become, these thoughts can inform our next behavior. <laughs> Nature has been waiting to be seen so that she would see the beauty of herself. So she invented you, human beings, to stop doing and start being. And so when we commune with Earth in the form of food production, and we imagine forests full of food again that would rain down a bounty upon us that would fuel us into the brightness of 10,000 suns within every single human being with every single meal we would consume. When we light up the universe with that, it's going to depend on the frequency of our resonance as to the results for the multiverse. Why are all the souls clamoring in right now to be a part of this grand experiment of pain and suffering that is the human journey. What's the big deal? We're given a few glimpses in some of these prophecies, but I think the big one that gets me excited is that our universe is about to go through a conformational change at its sacred geometry. The spin and activity of our universe is about to shift into the 13th dimension. The Earth, if you haven't heard, shifted dimensions recently. About 2016, 17, we shifted into the fourth dimension. We'd been in a third dimensional spin state, so that whole double torus thing that I told you about with the donuts and the black hole and all those shapes, the Earth itself has this intense gravitational field and it's organized in a three dimensional spin state until that three dimensions decayed into a fourth dimension state in 2017. And then, right within just months of that, it started to have to shift into the fifth dimensional vibration or fifth dimensional. Uh, sacred geometry because the fourth dimension is very unstable. We've been in third dimension since the beginning of the planet, probably 14 billion years ago, and now it's moved into the fifth dimension. It turns out when you're a being that is committed to the third dimensional vibration, when you're living on a fifth dimensional planet, the likelihood of friction happening at your cellular level suddenly goes way up. Friction in physics results in biology as inflammation. Since 2017, have we seen an explosion of friction on the planet? Did we choose to blame that on a virus? As we saw millions of people dying from many different things. Advanced type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all kinds of stuff, new cancers, all that. And we blamed a virus for that. I think it's a simple phase shift happening to the planet that's forcing a change in us humans. And if we are so committed to the memory of being who we are, 
i.e. holding on to our three-dimensionality of trauma and the victim-perpetrator coin that we hold in the three dimensions, we will be destroyed, pulled apart by the fabric of a fifth-dimensional planet. All the souls jumping in right now are in a rush to get here because the universe is about to shift its vibration. And when we go into the 13th dimension, it's thought that that is when this universe connects to the multiverse. That's pretty interesting. We may be right on the bubble of a transformational change in our universe in which we will connect to the multiverse. We know the multiverse is there. If any, some of you heard me talking earlier this week and, and we have great scientific evidence that this universe is not isolated or alone. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, the first one, you remember the first law of thermodynamics was you can either create or destroy energy. Second one is any system left in isolation increases its chaos. Any system witness increases its syntropy, opposite of entropy, opposite of chaos. Left in isolation, you increase entropy. When not isolated, you increase entropy. Do we live in a syntropic or an entropic universe? Astrophysicists is really argue over this. And the calculations are now looking like we're pretty damn close to equal chaos and creation. But when I look around at all of your faces, I can tell you I live on a syntropic planet because we have energy fields entering the wombs of women that can self-organize a Noah. That's spectacular, syntropy. Syntropy, the opposite of chaos. So the fact that we are capable of becoming syntropic within this universe says to me that we cannot be alone or else the second law of thermodynamics is wrong. So this universe I don't think is alone. I think it can be seen, but it may be disconnected energetically from our surrounding members that would witness us. And in the 13th dimension connection, it is said that it will depend on where we connect to the multiverse, depending on the vibration of this universe at that moment. The location at which we connect, high vibration, low vibration, joy or suffering, as a universe, depends on the next few minutes of our vibration. That's a trippy responsibility. And souls are clamoring onto this planet right now to express human bodies because it seems that this galaxy, with this lone planet in its midst, sits uniquely at one of the chakra centers of the universe. It seems that it may be sitting in the heart chakra of the universe us at the midpoint between the tiniest thing and the largest thing us as manifested imagination of light being pressed into particles us being imagined by the microbiome in all of its iterations of the billions of years we now are manifested end of an epoch to self-organize into a new state of being in which we vibrate at a high vibration of joy and love such that when we connect to the multiverse we bring that state into the multiverse and we connect at a state in which we will receive that vibration. Have you noticed what you collect to yourself when you are in a state of joy? Have you noticed what you bring to yourself when you are in a pissy mood? <laughs> Humanity is in a fucking pissy mood right now. We are so angry at each other. We're so upset with the journey. We're so damn judgmental towards the oil companies towards the politicians, towards everybody we can think of. I can be judgmental on a damn subway to a bunch of strangers. I don't even know what they're thinking. And I can be like, that person's clearly crazy. <laughs> in a split instant, subconsciously making all these judgments, we are in a pissy mood. And we're about to connect to the multiverse. And so we need to shift the attitude so that we can be the new bodies that will vibrate with brighter light to a different frequency such that when we walk into the room of the multiverse, everybody turns their head and be like, oh, hell yeah. Look at who walked in just now. Look who just walked in. That's our decision. So as we wrap up here, 
I would like to give us the opportunity to move back into this room that's full of our ancestors and has given us new wisdom. Stuff came out of my head that's never come out of my head today. That's because your ancestors are speaking in this room. Your ancestors are helping me organize my experience because I am simply a light vibration that is a memory and an amalgamation of the imagination of the bacteria and fungi within me organized by human beings before me to become richer and richer in its human experience. And so I am an emanation of you. You are an emanation of your ancestors. We are all the imagination of the soil. So let's close our eyes. Acknowledge all the ancestors in the room that have brought wisdom to us today. And let's get less pissy. The last line in the Course of Miracles in that tome of work says that the last thing I will do in this human body, and I like putting emphasis on this, with the idea that there could be a new human body. The last thing I will do in this human body is let go of judgment. That's the entire course. How do you become the full manifestation of miracle? It's as simple as that. Let go of judgment. Most of all on yourself. Stop judging yourself. You're just a little Noah. You came here to be childlike in your spirit and your heart to show humanity that it is not in any state of responsibility over the state of affairs of the planet. It is instead invited into the full fruition of nature's miracle that we would call an imagination that is being manifest through a colon that was uniquely anatomically designed to hold more biodiversity than any other thing in nature's history, such that more intelligence would flow into your central processing unit that we call the gray matter in your head, a brain, such that you would have a thought of the possibility of becoming something different than you are today. You are a freaking miracle, people. And you are constantly disappearing and reappearing every millionth of a second, so stop taking it so seriously. What do we need to lose judgment on today? Who do we need to lose judgment on? What do we need to forgive? There are no enemies among us. There are those of us that are connected and disconnected at different intervals to the consciousness around us, but there's literally no enemy. There's no indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. There's only ancient souls that are filling space-time and manifesting for a couple millionths of a second a human body that chooses to be indigenous to this planet at this moment such that it would contribute to the heart chakra vibration of a universe that's ready to decide what dance card it wants to fill. Let's let go of the judgment. Let's let go of the judgment. Let's let go of the judgment and let's call in the vibration of love and joy. Love is not an emotion. This was a huge turning point in my life. One of my best friends, I had been railing against the concept of love for years. I was telling everybody, you don't know what the fuck love is, else you would act a lot different. And I was really disappointed in humanity because I, I knew we were not going to reach enlightenment to be able to participate in the universe because if the universe is made of love, then we don't get it. And we're, I had no hope that humanity could get there if love was the secret, if love was the code that we needed to figure out because we are just so bad at it. And then my best friend did a clerogenic journey with fight play on medicines and had a 15 minute conversation with Christ energy that he called me up later and said, Zach, I can talk to Christ for 15 minutes. He's got a lot to say to you. I can't tell you over the phone, so you have to come in person. So eventually, a couple months later, I would think I would have made it more a priority. It took me a couple months to get to his place in Park City, Utah. And he wouldn't tell me. And so we started playing music, and then we had dinner and hung out with his family and got up the next morning to go to the airport. And he still hadn't told me. He's like, I'll take you to the airport. Okay, great. And we used to, you want a cup of coffee? I'll have a cup of tea. I don't drink coffee. Okay. So we stopped by this tea shop. 
And we sit down with this cup of tea. And he says to me, Christ wants to tell you, Zach, that the fabric of the universe is not love. And I started crying and had goosebumps all over my body because I knew that the next sentence that came out was going to explain everything to me. Everything that I'd been fighting against in my life, all my hopelessness was about to be erased by the next sentence. He said, the fabric of everything is beauty. And when you see the beauty, you will experience love. The reason we have fucked up love so thoroughly is we thought that it was a thing that needed to be constantly created. We thought it was something that would happen to us. Love is simply the vibration that occurs when one being witnesses beauty in another. We are so damn good at seeing beauty because we're the only species given five senses to stand on the platform to see nature for what she is. We're the only species maybe that can emanate love. Something would have to be given the five senses that we have to be able to emanate love. So why the fuck are you at the heart chakra of the universe? Because you have five senses that equip you to see her beauty. And when you see her beauty, you will vibrate in love and you will change the destiny of a universe. So, now that we've given up judgment, Let's experience beauty. And I feel inspired to just ask all of us to join hands. You guys are all close enough to just grab some hands. If you don't have a hand, grab a shoulder, grab a knee, something socially acceptable. <laughs> grab a body part. Get all connected. Close your eyes. What do you feel coming out of that other hand? Holy shit, that's a bunch of warmth. That must be a sun burning next to you. 10,000 times brighter than the one in our solar system. Did you know that that was a sun next to you when they sat down? Did you know how bright they burned before we started talking? Did you know that it was 10,000 brighter, times brighter because it's in its biologic expression of a finite particle state of an infinite soul that's chosen to be here right now? such that it could be seen and be seeing a universe of beauty. What beautiful thing that out of 8 billion people we picked this room to sit in today. We picked this room to be together in. What beauty. These are not strangers in this room. This is a collection of a hundred souls that are fulfilling ancient contracts that said we would come together at the tipping point of the universe to sit in a room after a week in the mud with the mushrooms and the rest to reimagine the beauty of the universe, to re-witness the beauty of the universe such that we would vibrate in a state of love never felt before in our hearts. Are you willing to be loved today? Are you willing to be seen for the beauty you are today? No, fuck that shit. Are you willing to be seen today? Yes! <laughs> I have been blessed to see each of your faces for these last hour or so. It is so beautiful to see each of you here in your full beauty. Letting go of all of the traumas of the past. Because when we let go of the victim perpetrator coin that keeps flipping through the slot machine of human behavior, when we let go of that coin and stop valuing that stuff so that we stop pulling on the goddamn arm of the slot machine to get another delivery of victim perpetrator money, we become creator. Outside of victim perpetrator is creator. Let's go create a new human state of being. Grateful for all of you. Thank you for teaching me again today, allowing me to reflect back your beauty, allowing me to organize through my neurologic network, the intelligence that sits within this room, 
most of which is concentrated in the shit in your colon. <laughs> I love all of you very much, and I'm very blessed to spend time with you. We love you. Yeah. Yeah.